In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I hope you're having a, a great morning. Um, we are now in the last part of our series on the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, you know, one of the goals for this series was really to take a deep dive into the meaning of each of the parts of the Lord's Prayer. Because we know how important this prayer is, and I just want to spend the beginning part to emphasize that. You know, oftentimes in the church, when we say things on repetition, we say things multiple times, it's very easy to just, just uh, recite it without actually understanding its true meaning, without meditating on what we say. And the goal is to really take bits and pieces of, this, of, this, of the prayer and, and to meditate on it so that when we are in church, when we are in our homes, that, you know, you don't have to meditate on all of it or think about all of what's meaning. You could take bits and pieces, right? And, and think about certain things that, you know, that, that's on your mind or that's, um, you know, that, that you, can, you can spend time and actually uh, meditating on even after we say it, right? So one of the things I want to do before I get into the last part is emphasize the importance of this prayer. This prayer is given in uh, two of the uh, synoptic gospels, the gospel, Matthew and, and Luke. And they're not exactly the same as far as uh, the, the actual text, but the meaning is the same. And typically the one that we understand or the one we say is, is the one from Matthew. But both of them, in both instances, they were given to his disciples. Notice that there wasn't any crowd, there, it wasn't given to a crowd or anything. And you kind of have to think about that, right? The, the disciples in Luke were asking Christ to teach them to pray, just as John the Baptist taught his disciples. And in Matthew, similar uh, idea on the Sermon on the Mount. And it was only given to the disciples. Father Thomas Hopko, who's an Eastern Orthodox um, late priest, he passed away in 2015, modern day theologian. He gives a, uh, a lecture on this and he emphasizes that, you know, this was in the early church he talks about how this was really only given to christians this prayer was so special it was almost like even in secret i think he says and it was a secret prayer it wasn't publicly said and it was before their baptisms so remember in the early church it's not like today we're christian and you know when when we have kids you know the the, the babies are baptized right away we had you know many many adults right in in the early church they were being baptized so they had to go through a training process and he says saint john chrysostom says it was delivered to the catechumens right on great thursday uh so they had thursday friday saturday to learn uh the lord's prayer before they were baptized right and this in the early church, um, you know, this baptism, it happened um, at the resurrection. And then if you ever wonder why in the 50 days we only read the Gospel of John, right, is because now they are being baptized into Christ, into Christianity. And now they, their eyes are opened and they know who Christ is. And this is the Gospel of John, the wisdom gospel, right, is, 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 is all about, you know, that, that teaching. And he also says St. Augustine in the West, they delivered it on Lazarus Saturday or Palm Sunday. So they had like a week, you know, to learn the prayer. So just, it's, we stress the importance of the prayer because, again, sometimes we lose sight of the actual meaning. We take it for granted. We say it so many times and we're quick to say it, including myself, right, uh, as, you know, we just we say it quick. I could probably say it in like, you know, five seconds if I, if I really wanted to say it quick. But, you know, how, how valuable is that? It's the quality, right, versus the quantity. Um, and if you notice the, the importance of this prayer, um, we say this in the liturgy, right? In, in the fraction, um, uh, after the, the, the prayer, the fraction, and the liturgy, um, the priest says, May we dare, or boldly, right? We say with boldness, dare we say, and make us worthy to say, our Father, and then the, the congregation says, our Father who art in heaven. I mean, if you ever think about those words, right? Boldness, and dare we say. So it's a very important prayer. And, you know, the, uh, again, the goal of the series is to really stress that importance and to give us tools, things to think about, you know, what, what, what does it actually mean in my life? 
right? When we say thy will be done, uh, when I say our father, right? And each, each of those pieces is something we can, you know, you could have a lecture or many lectures on each of those pieces, but you know, our goal was to just give stress the importance of this. So we're going to focus on in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you, you know, the remaining of the prayer that we currently say today has has two parts. So after last week we had lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then we say in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then we say for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. We're going to focus on just in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But um, from some very little research that I, you know, that I was doing. And if you notice this last part, we're going to be saying it very soon right during holy week and it's a doxology this last part is a doxology it's actually not in the gospels if you notice um and actually i've i've you know in speaking with um someone who who has done a lot of studying of coptic manuscripts you know his perspective is that this is actually not in our right in the coptic right for thine is the kingdom in christ jesus our lord is and what's interesting is I don't think that is in many of the, you know, Western or maybe in the Eastern Orthodox uh, right as well. I don't know if they use in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't believe so. But um, this this doxology for thine is the kingdom. It, it actually shows up on the Didache, which is the teaching of the Lord's uh, Lord to the Gentiles. So it's by the, the 12 apostles teaching. And they actually add this after the Lord's prayer. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the root, right, where, where I believe it came from. Um, but, you know, in the Coptic rite, uh, in the manuscripts, it has in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's very interesting that we, we have this because if you look at all our services or many of our services, it always starts with, right, in Christ Jesus our Lord. We always start, you know, the if it's Vespers, Matins, the liturgy, we start that. And, and we're going to meditate on this because I think it's very, it's very relevant as we approach the, 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 the week of passion, the passion week. And it's, you know, you say, oh, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, it's, but have you ever thought about that and why it's at the end of the Lord's prayer? We start with our father and then we say certain things, right? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth is it give us this day our daily bread right and then we end in christ jesus our lord because this is the only way that we can even begin to say our father this is how we know the father right from christ through the holy by the holy spirit so if, if you think it completes in a sense it kind of completes the lord's prayer right because we are only able to say our father in Christ. In Christ, we become saved. And this is what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to use a lot of a book that I recently read from Father John Baer. He is a uh, modern day theologian in the Eastern Church. I recommend reading, you know, anything of his. He's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very short book, but it talks about becoming human. That's the title of the book. Um, and I'm going to use a lot of the material. So if you don't want to listen to this, you could just read the book. Um, cause I, I, and I'll just su kind of summarize it because it's very relevant to, as I came to think about, well, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, what does that mean? Um, in his, in, a, in the beginning, he says, Christ shows us what it is to be God by the way he dies as a human being. And in so do doing simultaneously shows us what it is to be human, a human being, freely choosing to ground our life and existence in the self-sacrificial love that is God's. So we'll heavily reference this, and this book kind of takes us into a journey of how some of the earliest church fathers thought, right? And what it is to be human, right? We use this word a lot, but if you've ever thought about, well, what is a human being? And what we'll see is that in Christ, is how we actually become human and how we fulfill our purpose and our goal. St. Irenaeus of uh, Lyons, he is one of the earliest uh, church fathers. He was born in about 130 AD. 
Um, in his youth, he knew St. He knew Poly, Polycarp of Smyrna, who had in turn known the Apostle John, John the Beloved. And he says, you know, the glory of God is a living human being. The glory of God is a living human being. So what is a human being? Another uh, early, one of the earliest um, church fathers, St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, he says, it is better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to be king over the ends of the earth. I seek him who died for our sake. I desire him who rose for us. Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren, hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. And he wrote this, he was in captivity. Um, and he was on his way to his martyrdom. And he wrote many epistles. And in this particular one, he's essentially telling the, the, the people, um, you know, to not come after me, right? Don't come after me. It is better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to be king, than to have all the riches, right? Whereas we think the opposite. We do everything to not die, right? We preserve everything. We, we are, we're eating so healthy, uh, which is good. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but, you know, we, we do things. We spend so much time working out. And, and again, our health is very important and we should do that. But think about our actions and the things that we do. We do things to collect our, you know, to build up our wealth. We do things to build up our status. We do things to, um, to, um, you know, basically trying to do everything we can before that time of martyrdom or that time of death comes. And he goes on to say, suffer me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived here, I shall become a human being. Anthropos in, in Greek. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. It's, it's very interesting. I shall become a human being. If you ever notice that when we celebrate or commemorate a saint, it's their, it's always the, it's their martyrdom. So this is their birth. This is what they believed, you know, is their, is their true birth. And again, I think our perspective on death is one of the most important things that, you know, we need to have right. Because our, like I said, a lot of our actions are based on perhaps having a, a, a negative perspective of death or the, the old way of death, right? Christ has changed death. He transformed it. He took it from death into life. So when we say we die to our material desires, we die to the world and we live, right? Gain the world and you die. Lose the world and you live. And this is the exact thought of some of the earliest saints, right? Who are closest to those of the apostles who were with Jesus. And this is what they're saying about what it is to become human, what it is to die, and even the Desert Fathers, and you, you wonder, like, you know, how they sustain themselves and how they have the motivation, how they, 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 they persevered. And, I, you know, I think it's one of the, the main things that I believe is that they had the same perspective of death, that it wasn't death. It was a birth. It was a new birth into life. He also says, so he says, now that Christ is with the Father, he is more visible than he was before. So death becomes, Christ's death becomes a defining moment. It's not the end, but the beginning. It's not disappearance, but revelation. When Christ walked among us in the flesh, we never really understood who he was, right? The disciples, you know, it happened in the disciples, right? They never really understood. And they were with them. We were with him, right? So, but now that he passed through the, his passion, right, and is with the Father, we finally see who he is. And this is what St. Ignatius is talking about. And it's why this time period is so special and why I wanted to focus on it. Because, you know, when we say in Christ Jesus our Lord, it's a very important part, right, of the Lord's Prayer that we say 
And it's how we come to know the Father and how we come to, and through his passion. So, you know, we say in Christ, Jesus our Lord. It's how we, and through his passion, is how we come to know him and how we are able to say our Father. So how did, the, how did this happen with the disciples? It's always good to reference back. And the disciples came to know Christ, as I noted, that only through the Pascha of our Lord, of the Lord, the Passion. So, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is only through the Passion that they came to know who Christ truly is. Before the cross, the disciples, they just didn't understand who he was. But when they see him crucified, well, you think, oh, now I understand. No, they don't, right? right? They run in fear. Peter, you know, during, before he was crucified, Peter denies him, right? Nor when they discovered the empty tomb, right? They would ask if the body is stolen, etc. Et um, but the example that we have in the road to Emmaus um, is the perfect example of, you know, how we come to know Christ and how even the disciples came to know Christ. So in this in this passage, right, there are two disciples. This is after the, the resurrection. There are two disciples walking along the road. And, you know, Christ appears to them as a stranger. And, the, you know, the story goes that, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're um, Christ, um, they, they invite him. They're walking along with the stranger. And, um, you know, um, they're t- telling him about telling the stranger about what what has recently happened, etc. Christ, you know, sits down with them. They open scripture. They read about what Moses and the prophets said about Christ, etc. And they break bread. And only then, right, are the disciples' eyes open, and they finally realize who he really is. And then Christ, dis- you know, disappears. Saint Augustine says, "Through him you sought us." When we were not seeking you, but you sought us that we might begin to seek you. It's a very lovely saying. So through him you sought us. We weren't seeking him, just kind of kind of like the, you know, um, in, the, in, the, in the passage. But you sought us that we might begin to seek you. And through Christ, this is how this happens. And it's important to know how the disciples came to know Christ because for, for a couple of reasons, sometimes we think, oh, you know, the disciples were lucky and, you know, they got to spend Christ with them. If I were there, um, that I probably, I would have known, you know, uh, you know, I wouldn't have denied him or I would have, I would have known, I wouldn't have run in fear. And there's, so there's really no historical distance between uh, the disciples back then and us. They abandon Christ, Peter denies them, and to this day we do the same thing, right, when we sin. We are essentially, we're missing the mark. Sin means hamartia in Greek, which means missing the mark. And we are, um, so, it, and it is by his death that Christ conquers death, revealing life everlasting. This conquering of death is, very, is, is, what, is what we'll focus on. But it's important to know, like even the you know even even the disciples had the, the kind of the, the how they came to know Christ, and we know. Let's see. Uh, actually, yeah, I'll go to this. So, um, so destroying death by death, and we say this in the feast of the resurrection and during the fifty days, right? Christ is risen from the from the dead, trampling down death by death. Father John Bear says, It is because he conquers death by his death that he enables all men and women also to use their own mortality to come to life in him. So, God doesn't show, he talks, uh, you know, Father John Bear in the book talks about, he doesn't show himself to be almighty, as we tend to think of, you know, a God, right? moving mountains, throwing lightning bolts. You know, this isn't our God. Um, And if you think about it, death is the only thing that men and women have in common from the beginning of the world and onwards, right? It's it's the one thing we all have in common, despite what religion you are, despite what gender you are, 
despite what culture you are, through everything. Death is the one thing we have in common. So Christ, in Christ, right, Christ reveals what it is to be God through the only thing we have in common. And it's not just death, but the way he has died. The way he has died. And again, think about it. Like if he were rich and powerful and, you know, he would, some people would have been excluded, right? It wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been re relatable to all of us. Or if he died because he is God and he'd be able to get himself out of the grave and, you know, not great for us, right? But he conquered death. Mortality, it's not a property of God. Creating life is not a property of humans. So Christ essentially brought both of those together. Conquering death by his death and the way he died, being crucified on the cross and resurrected on the third day. And, and you know, from a theological standpoint, um, this is kind of the heart of our faith. And what a lot, many of the consuls and many of the contentions uh, in the Council of Chalcedon, which was the first, you know, separation of the, you know, of, of, of churches, is, so this is what it is to be God. This is the heart of the faith defended in the consuls. One concrete being, hypostasis, one, one being, one person, you know, one face, prosopon in, in Greek. Both are revealed together. And this is why we say, without confusion, without change, without mingling, right? Without division or separation. So again, mortality is not a property of God and creating life is not a property of humans. Christ has essentially joined both of those. He's brought both together and he's conquered death by his death. And it's, a, it's um, so we come back to this, this human being and it's interesting when you compare some of the Gospels and how they've um, accounted certain uh, events. You know, because at, at the end of the Gospels, they finally know they know Christ. But when we look at the Gospel of John, after the prologue, the prologue, prologue, I can't say it. After the beginning, right, there's a, the, there's a narrative. Um, and... It, it immediately goes into, Behold the Lamb of God. And again, John's gospel is very special. And it's reserved for the 50 days. Every Sunday, all right, all the, 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 the reading of the gospel is from John. We only read John. And in the early church, as I noted earlier, right, they used to be baptized during um, uh, for the resurrection. And then they are now, right, Christian. And they can now understand John's gospel, right? That's kind of the, the logic behind it. Because in the other gospels, it wasn't seeing the empty tomb or even meeting the risen Christ that, that you know, un, that persuaded them. It was rather the opening of scriptures. It was the breaking of the, of the bread, the rota emels that I, um, that I referenced, right? When the two disciples were walking along the path and Christ visits them. And this is this is important because, you know, think about how do we how do we come to know Christ? And, you know, th the Orthodox Church is very centered around the Eucharist. And you have to think, well, how do I partake in the Eucharist and the liturgy? How am I coming late? Am I coming early? And, you know, how how am I treating it? Am I preparing myself? Am I doing the readings beforehand? Or am I coming even just for the readings? And this is why we emphasize that, you know, we should all be there in the beginning with matins because they're, you know, mat well, actually from Vespers, but, you know, just, you know, baby steps, right? Think about how you've been attending the liturgy because the disciples came to know Christ, right? Through the example that we have, right? They read scripture, they spent time with him, they, uh, they broke and they broke bread and they, and they came to realize um, who Christ is, that he is the suffering servant, right? That Isaiah spoke of. Um, so, and, and, and I, I, you know, I'd like to take time to meditate because even I, I sometimes, even if I'm there and for the reading, sometimes I get distracted and, you know, but 
I, I think step one is is the readings are very, very important. They aren't there just for, you know, for reference and, you know, so the deacons can just, you know, have something to do. I mean, they're there for, for, for a purpose. They're there for a purpose and they're necessary. They're necessary for us to go along this journey to really know who Christ is because we have the example uh, from the disciples. John, like I said, depicts, uh, immediately depicts Christ as the exalted Lord from the beginning. Um, he's not abandoned. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on going back to the, to the human being and how John depicts Christ. John depicts Christ when he's at the cross, not abandoned, right? His mother is there and the, his beloved disciples, you know, are there. And the words of God, why have you forsaken me, right? That's in the other Gospels. Um. In, in, um, in John, he says, it is finished, and he hands over the Spirit. So, you kind of have to think, well, what is finished? And St. John Chrysostom says, or, or just to, to go back on this, uh, um, in the night in which he was given up, no, rather gave himself up. And this is important, right? Of, of John's like transition. It's not perceived as he was given up, but rather he gave himself up. He hands over the spirit. It is finished. And if you've ever think about that, you know, when we, when we read this, you know, what is finished? Have you ever thought about that? Was it his, his mission? Okay. Well, well, what his, was his mission? And if you thought about the deep meaning of that, We'll go back to St. Irenaeus of Lyons. He says, the work of God that is finished is the fashioning of the human being. So St. Irenaeus, Irenaeus points out that the way Christ, and he, and he references this, today's gospel, actually, the, 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 the blind man, he actually references this part of the gospel. And if you notice on how Christ heals the blind man, he mixes spit his spit and earth right the mud or the dirt and he parallels this to our initial fashioning the mixing of the power of god with the dust of the earth and he concludes that the work of god is the fashioning of the human being and the, okay so the work of god what is you know we said it's the fashioning of the human being so it only makes sense to go to Genesis and we look at how Christ created the world and created us. There's a, there's a divine, I guess, um, uh, let it be, right? When you read the uh, creation account, God says, let there be light. Let there be, right? And there was light. Let there be a firmament, 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 right? And it was so. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered, right? And it was so. Let the earth bring forth vegetation, and it was so. Let the earth bring forth living creatures, and it was so. So for these parts of the world, it was sufficient to bring all these creatures into existence. This was sufficient right? This let it be. Um, and then when he gets to the human, the human being, Anthropos, he says, let us make the human being in our image after our likeness. It's the only thing that is not followed by, and it was so. It's the only thing. You have to wonder, well, you know, why? Why were the other things sufficient, right, to bring into existence, and it was so, but not Anthropos, mankind, the human being? So the project of God is not completed by his word alone. If you read of what Pontius Pilate says, 
and we'll read in the the, the holy passion the week of passion and we'll read in in john he says it says in the in the, in the english translation it says behold the man but if you look at the greek it says, behold the anthropos, the human being, the human being. Sometimes that might be overlooked. What does it mean? The man. Yes, he is a man. But if you, it, that's why it, this is why it's important sometimes to reference the, um, the textual, you know, some of the, the, the original texts or other translations because they, they would have deeper meaning. So then Christ is the first human being in history. Christ is the first human being in history. Christ as human, Father John Bear says, completes what he himself as God has predetermined to take place. Say it again. Christ as human completes what he himself as God has predetermined to take place. So we become human by following Christ through our own martyrdom, our own witness, our own confession to him. Just as I referenced in the beginning of this lecture of how St. Ignatius of Antioch thought of martyrdom, that it was his birth, right, into life by following, right, the, passion, the, the example that Christ has set. So his martyrdom in Christ right, will allow him, our witness in Christ will allow us to become a human being, to fulfill that work of God. And St. Maximus the Confessor says, you know, we know that Adam, well, before I get into that, Adam introduced a pleasure, a form of pleasure that culminates in pain. For example, eating for the sake of pleasure, eating leads to gluttony, etc. And you can you can find many other examples of the pleasures of this world culminating in pain. Um, and it could be pain, physical pain. For example, if I smoke or if I drink or if I do certain things that you know affect me bodily, um, it could also be pain. Um, spiritually, um, it could be pain, just, just general, you know, general pain. This pleasure, this worldly pleasure culminates in pain. So St. Maximus says, Christ has provided another beginning and a second birth, Genesis, for human nature, which through the vehicle of suffering ends in the pleasure of the life to come. So death once once it has ceased from having pleasure as its birth mother, that pleasure for which death itself becomes the natural punishment clearly becomes the father of everlasting life. Again, this the, the, the perspective of death and what death meant has been flipped. So in... And Father John Barry goes on to say, in and through Christ, we now have the possibility of freely using the givenness of our mortality to be reborn, coming to be in a life without end. So in Christ, this is how this all happens. And the key word here is freely, right? We always talk about... Um, you know, free will and, you know, part of, um, part of the design, right? Because it's a very important part of our being. You know, St. Irenaeus has a very interesting perspective as well uh, on the Adam and Eve um, account. And he actually depicts them as infants in paradise, kind of like spiritual infants. They needed to grow in order to achieve perfection. We, right, were not created perfect. There needs to be kind of like a, a progression, like training, if you will. 
And the example Father John Bear gives, like a mother, she could give a newborn child meat rather than milk, but that's not going to be beneficial, right? We learn of our weakness, but also simultaneously come to know the greatness of God manifesting in our own weakness, transforming us from mortal to immortality. So, and he uses, right, the, the very, you know, uh, famous quote from Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. If we are to know the strength of God, right, there's an experiential process. We need to know how weak we are, what it is to be weak, if we are to know the strength of God. For Christ, as Christ, like, so he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So St. Irenaeus says the only, you know, and summarize, the, so the only way we can be created beings where there, or there can be created beings who can freely respond to God in love, who can adhere to him in love, and so in love come to share in his existence. And he says, if, you know, aside from that, then we kill the human being in us. It's very hard, very strong words. Similar to Jonah, right? Before the, the uh, Lent started, it's the creature, uh, Jonah and the whale or the creature, for him to learn. So Jonah is, he's not just a sign of the Savior or a type of Christ. He's also, it's a sign of the perishing human race. So at the same time, he's a sign of the perishing human race and he's a sign of the Savior. So we are not created perfect, you know, perfect. And so when we look at the cross in the coming weeks in the in the week of passion i really want to focus on this part you know because we're going to say the lord's prayer many many times and when we finish it i want to focus on you know that in christ through the cross and in is how i become how i become human Every aspect of creation, all that was needed was let it be. For us to come into existence, it required a creature able to give his or her own let it be. And this is the, you know, the, the, the crux, I guess, of this, uh, of, um, of this meditation or, or this lecture. You know, if we do not learn this, then we will always look at death as a painful aspect of life. We know it's inevitable. We're going to try to avoid it as much as possible. We're going to fear it as much as possible. We're going to live in fear. We're going to try to do things that, you know, preserve our life here, that make sure that we enjoy our, my life to the fullest. Right, a lot of the a lot of the trend is to just be happy. Um, is is more of a selfish aspect of happiness. Is what you know what what I want, me me me. Um, how my life looks to others and and social media. How again, how I need to be. You know, I I need to have this much money and this much prestige and this much education by this age. Um, or, you know, or uh, I'm going to be sad and depressed and I'm not achieving. And, you know, you're always going to look at time, the time you have, right. From, a, from an angle that, oh, I have, I have to do so much and I have to get this, 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 this done. There's not enough time. And so, so our, our perspective of death, in my opinion, changes a lot of how we behave and how we live our life. So it's a very important you know, we're doing things that we can't take with us. And why are we not doing things that will make us ready for our second birth, for our real birth into, uh, into paradise? And when we hear in the week of passion and when we, when we, we live with Christ, when we go through all the events, uh, it's a very special time. And we need to think of this, especially on Good Friday, that 
when Christ says, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he's completing the work of God. He's letting it be. He's saying, let it be for him to finish that work. So we have to sit and, and, and think about it. Christ is on the cross. This is at the point where everyone abandoned him. He's hung on the cross. He was spat at. Um, you know, he says, God, why have you forsaken me, etc. And only then does he say, I commend my spirit. He says, forgive them. And then he commends his spirit. So in the worst of times, this is the example that we have to, we have to um, emulate. We have to learn how to let go, to become dispassionate, not attached to material possessions and riches, even to family and my own image and myself, like I was mentioning. Because this example is what we should set. You know, if we were abandoned by everyone we love, if we were, you know, left out to, you know, to, you know, um, forget the saying, but if we were, we were abandoned, people, um, did us wrong, so many evil things, um, you know, would we say the same thing? Would we say, let it be? Would we say, um, would we say, forgive them? Would we say, and, and, and again, we have, we, to, to fulfill our real nature or our, 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 um, to become a human being, right? It requires this response from us. And this isn't something that we can get quickly. It's not an instant gratification that we get from technology today. And this is why our services, um, that I, I feel we are blessed, that we have very long services. You know, if we are trying to, to reach this point, it's not something that I could do with 20 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of prayer, one minute of prayer. It's something that needs to be constant, consistent, and really prioritize in time. So as we approach the, the week of passion, you know, right, we have this uh, remaining week and then uh, the last week uh, of passion, think about how we will imitate Christ and say, let it be, right? Think of him on the cross and everything that had happened to him and how he still said, you know, Father, forgive them, how he still commended his spirit. He said, let it be. Will we say that? Right. No matter what instance and, and condition we're living in, will we say, let it be. So when we when we say in Christ Jesus, our Lord, right, we can take this as some things that we can meditate on because we say the Lord's Prayer so many times. And, you know, you can rewatch any of the lectures It's online and you can focus on various aspects of the Lord's Prayer. It's a very important prayer. We don't want to take it for granted. It's it's the one thing that, um, you know, if you don't have words to say, right, we learn from the Lord's Prayer. And that's all that is uh, that is needed. Um, everything, you know, should fall under that wing or, or that prayer. And we have the Psalms. There's many resources. But again, just as, you know, the focus on today, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, it, it is a special saying. It is what fulfills the formula of the Lord's Prayer or the kind of, yeah, the, the formula that we can say our Father. And what we need is to say, let it be. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.